So for me personally, it is a real honour and a privilege to speak here in the Pitman's Parliament, uh, a building that's been rightly recognised of national importance by Historic England recently. I was born and brought up in the communities that are represented here in this room, and I feel an overwhelming surge of emotion every time I walk into here as I think about the ordinary working men, some of them members of my family, who sat here to improve the communities and directly influence the politics of the day. This is not, though, a place of the past. What excites me is the renewed potential of this building to provide education, nurture our culture, and act as a focus for binding our communities together, just as this Pitman's Parliament was built brick by brick by the pennies and halfpennies of working miners organising themselves in response to the impact of the first Industrial Revolution. So our communities need an institution like this, which will protect, support and enable them to adapt to the transformational impact of the fourth Industrial Revolution. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the first Industrial Revolution. Founded in Britain on coal and steam, it was accompanied by a surge of invention. The second and third Industrial Revolution saw the introduction of electrification and automation. But just as the first Industrial Revolution replaced muscle with machine, so the fourth Industrial Revolution seeks to replace minds with machine learning. We can all conjure images of that first Industrial Revolution where Stevenson's rocket or the spinning jenny transformed Britain and the world but also led to the societal disruption of urban relocation and the smokestacks of Victorian England. So think about the change today and the work of a company like Boston Dynamics which has developed a robot to perform the basic human task of turning a door handle. It looks part dog, part boa constrictor, yet in a year the robots now work in packs and they use computer vision to leap across boxes. My approach to this shift from workers to algorithms is grounded in a sincerely held belief in the value of good work. Values I've inherited from the founders of this very hall. The importance of work in creating a sense of self-worth, of confidence, of purpose, the cohesive way in which work holds our families and societies together. I say this having experienced what it is like to live in a community where there is a lack of work, to live in a family where there is unemployment. This experience has brought home to me the destructive and depressive power of worklessness and a drive to ensure that as few people as possible will live through it. We must acknowledge that these new technologies bring risks, cause stress and are contributing to a crisis in mental health but we must embrace them and seek to benefit from their potential to decarbonise our environment and improve our lives and our society for the better. The fourth industrial revolution is revealing that there are fundamental flaws in our economic system. We need a new economic model. Relentless drive to maximise gross domestic product ignores well-being and increases inequality, something I first raised in a speech in 2017. What was then considered radical is now increasingly mainstream. The GDP is outdated and has the potential to be fully broken by these new technologies. Now, to understand why this, why this is the case, consider this. I play the cornet in the Durham Miners Association brass band. And I learned to play when I was nine, and my tutor at the time was employed by the local authority. My early lessons, stumbling and unmusical as they were, did at least contribute to GDP. This year, I'm learning to play the trombone using entirely free tuition from YouTube. While adding greatly to my personal satisfaction, if not that of my family, this transaction is invisible to the economy. It does not contribute to GDP. Now, why is this important? If we take GDP as our primary measure of progress, we ignore the wider sharing economy, which is unquantified but valued by people. This is something well understood by the communities in County Durham, who have always and instinctively stepped in to support one another, whether as a result of individual misfortune through structured welfare programmes, as Ross described, or during times of industrial strife. Not only are our measures wrong, but so is our perception of what constitutes a modern economy. We have an industrial strategy for the first time in 40 years, and yet it's strange that we have no strategy for energy, 
More than this, our industrial strategy has a sector deal for the creative industries, but not for steel. In September, I met the Cabinet Secretary, Sir Mark Sedwell, when he visited my hometown of Horton Lispring. We discussed the damaging legacy from the closure of the collieries and the deindustrialization of this region. He was right to highlight this, but his words, in his words, there was an assumption that deindustrialization was an inevitability when in fact it is a choice. It is a misconception uniquely held in the UK that economic progress turns from manufacturing to services to financial services, whilst every other nation in the world realizes that wealth is built on a foundation of industry, and we know that this also builds community cohesion. We need not only to change the way that we measure progress in our economy, but to acknowledge where and how prosperity is created. In this high technology revolution, as in all previous technology revolutions, those nations and peoples that will prosper will be those that have a strong manufacturing base, supported by, not driven by, sophisticated services and financial services. As these new technologies have changed our economy, so the changes in economics are disrupting our society, with jobs in the Midlands and the North most at risk. Over two-thirds of the hardest-hit parliamentary constituencies are in these regions, but it's in Shadow Chancellor John Macdonald's constituency, which contains Heathrow Airport, that up to 40% of jobs are at risk from automation. Little wonder that he is more engaged than most politicians in this area. We can expect that if we pursue a similar course of non-intervention as we did with deindustrialization, then regional inequality will grow. Just as the robber barons of the late 19th and early 20th century managed to accumulate vast riches through their corporations, so the founders of Amazon, Facebook and the like, are able to corral a significant proportion of national wealth, but they are able to do this more quickly, with lower capital and with fewer employees than JP Morgan, Andrew Carnegie and the Rockefeller family could have imagined. Increasingly, the digital world enables mega corporations to be established and run by a very small number of people, concentrating wealth still further, driving an increasing gap between rich and poor and creating a more unequal society. This phenomenon is not new. It was also experienced in the first industrial revolution, only this time it is happening more quickly and it is reversing a trend of decades. The impact of these new technologies on productivity is also contributing to this inequality. In the past, it was taken for granted that increased productivity resulted in increased wages, but this is no longer certain. The broad sweep of history tells us that the first industrial revolution raised living standards like never before. This is true. But for a generation or more who lived through it, it was a misery. Living standards fell before they rose. Infant mortality increased before it reduced. Housing became dangerous before it improved. Just last Saturday, I attended the memorial service for Thomas Hepburn, the founder of the first miners' union. One of Hepburn's achievements was to fight and win for a reduction in the working shift for boys under the age of 12, from 18 hours a day to 12 hours a day. We must not forget that the rights and privileges we enjoy today have been the result of a struggle at great personal cost to the individuals involved. Whilst the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution undoubtedly have the potential to bring long-run improvements in all of our lives, we must not accept that there will be a period of lax regulation where gains can be exploited by a lucky few, whilst the struggle for equality and prosperity for the many begins anew. These challenges to our economy and society are leading to competing visions for the future of our country. We should not forget that the fascism which swept Europe in the 1930s was born at a time of the greatest income inequality and social change until the present day. Concerns over future capacity for employment have led to ideas such as the universal basic income and inequality has reignited the desire for greater employee involvement in companies whilst direct action is being taken on climate change. Set against this is the reality of insecure work and calls for greater deregulation. These new technologies do, though, enable people to work outside of existing economic clusters, meaning that decentralization, as well as democratization of industry and services, is now possible. One way we can both decentralize and democratize our economy is to adopt new models of ownership. In the past, societal forces drove the cooperative movement, and worker ownership is gaining popularity now even in private companies, such as richer sounds, 
Aardman Animations and even BT. But we need to go further. When setting up the Materials Processing Institute, I set aside commercial forms of ownership to create a not-for-profit entity with no shareholders and a democratically elected employee director on the board. I, like everyone in the company, am an employee, and we work together to deliver a shared vision. In conclusion then, the fourth industrial revolution has the potential to decarbonize our economy and to improve our lives, but there are competing visions for the future of our society, and we must fight to ensure that people are not forgotten, that we avoid rising inequality, and that we invest in our communities. We can do this by recognizing that progress is about more than increasing GDP, and that by decentralizing and democratizing our economy. We have a responsibility to do this to those like the Durham miners who have gone before us, those who worked hard to gain the rights that we now enjoy. But getting this right for me is also deeply personal. I have two small children, and I can be sure that whatever jobs they will be doing in 20 years' time probably haven't even been thought of yet. <coughs> But I want my children, and everyone's children, to have the opportunity through good work and secure employment for a fulfilling and purposeful life in a fair and equal society.